So uh, thank you once again. And um, now I would welcome here Mr. Zodelund to um, present his uh, speech and his presentation and uh, his view on current state and sustainability of supply chains. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, my name is Jan Söderlund. I'm based in uh, Gothenburg. I will not talk too much about SKF, but we are about 45,000 employees around the globe. And the main business is, of course, uh, bearings. And we have 91 factories around the globe. And you can see that uh, this, this is where we have the supplier structure, which means uh, we have direct material then sending parts around the globe. It's 5,879 suppliers around the globe. And uh, we have suppliers in 71 countries and they are delivering to our 91 factories. To the, to the, right, to the left, you see the countries. To the right, you see the flows. So it's a lot Europe, Europe from China. It goes to Europe and so forth. And one of our strategies is, of course, to get rid of all these China to Europe, China to US and stuff like that, because the last two years, it has created a lot of issues, a lot of delays. I will start a little bit talked about these uh, flows and the challenges in the flows. And then I will jump into uh, sustainability and what we are doing there to, to reduce our CO2 footprint. Uh, what we see right now about air cargo capacity, because the last one and a half year, I mean, we are sending by ship, air and ocean, the ocean freight is big, but the last one and a half year, we have had to use a lot of air shipment uh, because there has been so turbulent in the supply chain. And there has been a decline then in the air market. You don't, now I will show you some statistics, but you don't need to look at all the details, but you, I just want to show you a little bit what is going on. Uh, so capacity has been a decline, but you can see also here that uh, the last time, I mean, we use airline freighters, then we have this passenger belly where we send things in the, in the uh, passenger, trans uh, passenger airplanes where they have capacity for transportation too, and freighters. And it has been going up, but now we see that there are some big risks here because especially the belly is going down. Uh, when it comes to uh, air freight market, the outlook for it, uh, you can see that if nothing is really green, there are some congestions that is worse in some lanes and, and a little bit better on some, but nothing is really stable right now. <clears throat> uh, and if you look at uh, uh, the container index, you can see that the huge, huge increase we had, it went up. Then we had a, a, a slightly going down on the rates. But now we see it's very unstable. For, for 2022, we don't really know what will happen due to the situation of the market. Will the prices go up or will it go down? So we are following this, but it will be interesting to also hear, hear what, uh, uh, what Peter is saying. If you look at the ocean frights, this is a lot of figures, but if you look on the top left, the schedule reli reliability, if you see, the normal reliability on the ocean freight, you have like 65 to 85% reliability. But on the bottom, you see what it looks like right now. It's like 35% reliability. And then to the right, you have the late vessel arrivals. Normally it's uh, three, four or five days. Now it's seven, eight days. So with this, then for us, we need to book transportation earlier. The suppliers need to send the goods earlier. 
And then we also have to fill up the stock. And it's a lot of money that we have increased the stock just to be able to secure deliveries to, to the customers. The rail, we didn't use that much rail before, but that has increased. And rail uh, overall, there has been some challenges of, of the availability of train. It has been getting down a little bit the last time. There has been challenges when it comes to the, how to pass the borders. And that has been going much better. Uh, what we have seen on equipment, the containers and stuff like that, uh, that is actually a little bit better right now. And uh, lead times is also improved in uh, uh, the, role, the, the, the rail area. So we get the parts we want. We pay a lot of money for it. We have been forced to build up stocks, but we don't have any big, big stoppages. It's happened small stoppages now and then where we have to move production, but we keep things floating, but it's a lot of job. Just like one example when it comes to ocean rates, we negotiate every month ocean rates. We have reviews with the suppliers just to, because it goes up, it goes down. So it's so much work on, on uh, the pricing and the, to book the capacity. Uh, then also here, uh, you can see uh, the price and capacity index for the road. Uh, you see the, to the left, you see the capacity index for uh, road transportation. And then you see the blue, the price index. So there has been some increases in road, but it's not like it's so dramatic as we see for um, uh, air and ocean. And then there are some new roles coming up in road freight that might affect us. It's about, first it was, we had rules about the driving and the rest period. How, my, how much time uh, does the drivers have to rest? Now it's from February posting working hours. Uh, how that will be much more controlled how many hours the drivers work. Cabotage, that is, you know, it's a lot of companies uh, like companies that uh, uh, PO mailbox companies, they are register in one country, but then they work all the time in some other countries, long working hours. And uh, there will be new rules from February. And for the road in Europe, this thing will, of course, it's good because it's better competition, more fair competition, but it will, of course, also affect the pricing. Then I go, you will hear more about this. It will be interesting later to listen to Peter also and his view. Uh, now I jump in a little bit into decarbonizing because decarbonizing is also so important linked to, to the supply chain. Uh, within SQF right now, we have two big major targets. One is that uh, all our production facilities all over the world we'll have net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. So this is really the footprint of what we do in our factories, but also the offices. But then the bigger challenge, that is what we have set up as a target to by 2050 that our full supply chain from the suppliers, transportation to our factories, will be net zero. And that is a real big challenge. And what do we talk about? The scope, here you can see suppliers, SQF and our customers, and then you see the, the different scopes. Scope one, that is the energy and heat in our own factories and premises, but it's also the valid vehicles, scope two, that's all the energy. And with scope three, then we start to look at the complete supply chain with suppliers and also 
SKF and the, and the customers. So with suppliers, it's the transportation. We buy direct material, that's the steel and the rings and the balls, electronics. And then it's indirect material, the machines, the tools and stuff like that. It's the manufacturing equipment from the suppliers. And then in our own premises, there we will add the downstream transportation that's from us to, to the customers, the waste, the travel, but also our employees commuting, commuting to our premises. So that's the scope and that is defined by the European Union. And uh, for us, the scope is suppliers and, and SQF when it comes to the customers, their transportation, their, how they use our products. That, that is a very difficult thing for us. We cannot influence that. So that is out of our scope that we will focus on. Uh, this is actually our carbon footprint at SQF. So you see on the top, waste not that big, ICT not that big. You have the manufacturing equipment, it's not that big. Then you see travel, it's actually quite small. And these, those figures are 2019 figures in metric ton. Employee commuting, there you suddenly see that that is a little bit bigger. And then we come to the upstream transportation. If you look at the upstream transportation, that's quite big. Uh, indirect material, the, the green one, that's my area, biggest area of responsibility is not that big. But then we see direct material. And that is all the steel that we buy that we send around the globe. That is huge. And that will be a huge challenge. And then we have the energy scope and also what we have in the factory. So to 2030, it's the internal stuff, the energy use, but to 2050, we have to take away all this green one, the, the gray one, the direct material, so that all our steel suppliers, they need to be CO2, CO2 neutral. And if you look at our own operations, you see the, the revenue, the turnover, and then you see the energy use and the emissions. So what does this, this show that we are on a path then to take down our CO2 emission in quite a good way by, uh, of course, we have increased sales, but we have reduced the energy use. How do we do that? That is a lot of activities to stop machines when they are not on. It's to change machines and it's to do some big work when it comes to consumption for the buildings and stuff like that. But you also see that the, the energy use and the CO2 emissions is all, the CO2 emissions is going down more than the use. And that's because we have buy, start to buy a lot of green energy. And this thing is monitored very strictly in SQF. And we have been doing that for some years, but now the push, as you see, it's uh, increasing to really deliver on the CO2 emissions. So in operations, number one, the focus to improve energy and resource efficiency within our own uh, operations. It's to do ISO certification for our factory, factories. We have 91. Currently, we have done it in 44. And then a big challenge was we need to monitor the energy performance in all We have to measure it. We have the, now the new targets and also the investment. It's a huge, huge thing that we we invest in energy and resource efficiency. One thing is that we buy uh, solar cells and stuff like that. 
but it's also to replace all the old machines that uses too much uh, energy. Uh, and also we switched to renewable. Here is the 2020, we had 40% of all electric, electricity we bought was renewable. Now I got the figure last week for 21, and now we are up to 50%. Then we join associations like the RE100, where we have committed together with those other companies to go to 100% renewable. And natural gas is also a big area in SQF that we review, but because we need to find the alternative for the natural gas, we cannot continue to, to use that. And uh, for our suppliers then, the two big things, direct material, and then the goods transportation. And for our suppliers, we start now to increase the demand on them that they should have targets. Uh, the reporting, scope three emissions from the suppliers, we want them to report to so be follow it up. When we, do, when we select supplier now, we more start to have a selection criteria. It's their, it's their ability and their plans to reduce their emissions in the coming years. Uh, and then for the big suppliers, we do follow up their plans and support them. And the Steel Zero, joined, there is a association and we have joined associations to, to work on this steel uh, sustainability roadmap. And also we try to fund uh, research for the fossil free bearing steel. For the goods transportation, it's a lot about the sourcing and the requirement, but it's of course also the regionalization that we have to, we cannot buy, continue to buy steel in China, send it to Europe and US over time. We, today we send a lot to, to, from China to Europe and we also send a lot to Mexico for us, as example. So there is a lot of work to develop new suppliers. And let me see. Uh, I just want to show you an example. Those are the last slides, but those slides are probably the most important in this presentation because this is the ETS that's uh, the spot price for emission rights. And you see that the emission rights were at about 25 to 30 during 2020. And if you look at 21, you can see that it's going up to around 60, 63. Uh, if we then look at, um, um, excuse me for some Swedish here, but it's so you can see the figures. If you look at to the left, you see for Europe and USA, you see this what I told you about the, that's around 30, 2020, you see that 29. And if you look at 25, 40, it will go up to 63 and then up to 140 US per ton. That is the cost for the excess emissions. US from six to 63 to 140. And to the right, you see another E. -E IEA net zero 2050 report where they also show that this is going up. How much will it go up? No one knows. But how will this affect us? This is a real example. And this is probably the most important if you look at the supply chain and how we will work in the future. If you look at uh, the, the yellow line, sum of allowance, that those are the allowance for this particular supplier. This, is, this supplier is based in Europe and they have a allowance where, uh, where they can stay. On the uh, production, you see the production that is this gray going up and down. And 2021, you see two gray lines. One is if they increase production, the other is they are flat from today. And the green one, that is their 
plan for CO2 emissions. So if you look to the right, the reduction target, the green is what they have told us that this is our plan now to reduce the target because these suppliers, they are reducing the emissions. So the difference between the yellow and the green, what we see here is that they will ac actually be able to sell emission rights because you, according to their plan, they will be under the allowance. So they can sell, they will earn money. They will have an income. So if these supplier today have a competitive price, then in the future, they will even be more competitive. But if it's a supplier that is vice versa, now I took a good example. If it's a supplier where you see this green line, if it's above the allowance, then they have to pay a lot for the emissions in the future. So what this curve will look like with allowances in the future for the different countries, that is linked to what authorities will discuss and what rules we will have. That, and that is a thing we are following up. So by this, I just want to show you that the cost that we pay today's supplier will change significantly with losses as China's LNG uses supply concerns. Excuse me? Uh, sorry, it was my automatic here, my automatic okay. terminal. Okay, good. And then um, here we have the different associations we are collaborating with, Responsible Steel, Climate Group Steel, because it's a huge market that's following this right now. And for us, the strategy will, of course, be to find the good suppliers in Europe to deliver to Europe and the ones that has the best plan for reducing their emissions. That will be a key thing for the future. Okay. And anyone that is interesting to look at our target more in detail, if you want to use it for your business, then you can go to the SQF homepage and look at a positioning paper. There you have our strategy to reach uh, this target for 2050 more in detail. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Zedeland. Uh, and uh, now we have about uh, five minutes for a Q&A session. But, uh, my question is quite similar to that of Bruce Gay here in the chat. Uh, so I will read a question in the chat. The development of new steel suppliers new to your operations will involve cost-effective sourcing. This will be a challenge to profitability and shareholder return. How do you propose to attempt uh, to this uh, challenge? And my question is basically very similar to that one. So aren't you afraid uh, that uh, it will be really because you have said it's a huge challenge, especially to reduce emissions uh, on your supply chain, yeah. that it will be too costly for you, that uh, effectively it will be a big uh, push for your competitors, be it in China or United States or other countries that, will, that won't be so ambitious. Yeah. Uh, in this uh, reducing goals or goals of reducing CO2 emissions? Mm. Yeah, you, you can say that uh, in the end, it doesn't really matter what, what we as a company want. We want to do this. But the thing is that if we, this is business. If we want to sell bearings in the future, then we have to do it. So the, this is not like, we, we want to be in business to, to be a responsible company, but it's much bigger than that. If we want to stay in business, we have to do this. Because if you look at the automotive industry, they are the first. The automotive uh, business, they have already approached us and asked us about this. Volvo car, they have put the cost on the CO2 emissions, which means 
Now they select suppliers that can really show them that they are working on this on a, in a credible way. And this pressure is just increasing from our customer. So that we have to do it. And then the thing is that to be competitive on the market, we have to do this faster than our competitors. So going forward now, if you look at the steel mills, we have to find out the steel mills that have the most credible plan to be CO2 neutral. It could be a, a steel mill in China that is really good today, really efficient. And the prices are so good. But if they don't have a plan to take the CO emissions right, if there come regulations that will make their cost going up so much because they don't have any plan. If you compare that steel mill with a company in Europe or somewhere that really have a credible plan, they have already taken investment decisions where they in the coming three to two, four years will reduce their own CO2 emissions. They might be more competitive in the future. So in the end, this is business. It, the, for all companies in Europe, this has to be so clear that the ones who don't look at this risk to be out of business, this has to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. So if you look at shareholder value, this come from our shareholders, our board. This is one of the focus area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So your shareholders are basically okay with that and they see it as a way how to improve your uh, competitiveness in the future. It's absolutely competitiveness. And if we don't do this, we will not be competitive. We have to take this seriously and this, we have worked on it for many years. But what we have worked on it real for our own premises, our own uh, factories. We have achieved the result, but now these demands is just increasing so much. And now we have to take the responsibility for our supply chain. And then you see, then it's, the scope increases so much. Mm -hmm. uh, during your presentation, you have said that uh, you are, or you will be selecting your uh, suppliers uh, according to criteria, how they are green or, uh, uh, CO2 emissions efficient, mm -hmm. but there is a growing problem of uh, so-called uh, greenwashing. So some companies uh, are only pretending uh, that they are green or they are reducing their emissions, but in fact, they uh, don't. How uh, would you uh, select the, <laughs> the right from wrong, the mm -hmm. companies who are really uh, making uh, steps into uh, carbon neutrality and uh, companies who are just faking that and they are pretending they are doing that. Uh, I haven't been involved so much about faking because if you look at the steel mill, for example, they're all the, their emission because in each country now companies need to report it. So what we already today for all the European steel mills, you find the data on the internet. What I showed you about these uh, lines with the allowances and uh, where they are, they report it to authorities, which means this is available data. So a lot of this data is already available in when, when many of the, for, for many companies. Okay. And, and, also, and also, if you look at, uh, there are now a lot of standardization and rules of how to report this so that uh, we have credible reporting. It's a lot of work going on also on the reporting side. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much.